All right. So let's talk wound infections and the things that can cause them. Uh, first off, if we're going to talk about wound infections, we'd probably better spend at least a little bit of time talking about wounds first. Wounds can come in a couple of different ways, and each one has different dangers of infection. Uh, first off, you can have an incision, which is just the fancy name for a cut. Uh, incisions are typically narrow, uh, medium deep, and ble bleed profusely. So uh, here you can see like a typical uh, incision, except it would actually go you know, down. It would have a whole lot of depth there. And so it's going to bleed quite a lot. With uh, wound infections, there's basically two ways that wounds can get infected. They can get infected from the initial wounding incident. Um, so either the thing that causes the wound has some microbes on it, or the skin of the person being wounded will also have microbes on it. Um, so that's one way. Uh, the second way is you can have uh, secondary contamination, right? You have a wound, maybe it's a day old or something, or it's at least some time old, but the wound then gets dirty or gets some contamination in it, and, uh, uh, and that's how it gets infected, right? So you can have either a, a primary or secondary infection. Um, with incisions, uh, typically um, the, uh, you know, a nice thing about them is that they, uh, be well, sort of nice thing about them, is they bleed profusely. And like bleeding profusely is bad from a physiological perspective in the sense that you want your blood to stay inside of your body, not outside of your body. But one of the advantages of it is that the outflow of blood will tend to carry any contaminating microbes away from the wound. So uh, cuts and uh, incisions have a lower incidence of the uh, primary infection. Um, because they are kind of like medium deep and they bleed profusely, uh, they, um, they kind of, they take a long time to heal. Uh, often they need to be stitched shut. Uh, there's a big risk of them reopening. So, uh, secondary infections are a big problem with incision wounds. Uh, you need to make sure to keep the incision clean after the fact. And you want to make sure not to reopen them. Uh, second possibility is a puncture wound. This is where you have a usually small, sharp thing, like a nail or a needle or a thorn or a fang or a knife uh, that penetrates deep into the tissue. So, uh, there's a few problems with puncture wounds. Uh, they are, are most of the problems with primary wound contamination here. Uh, puncture wounds are typically pretty small, so they don't bleed that much and they tend to clot quickly, uh, which is good in that you don't lose a lot of blood, but bad in that lack of blood means that First off, they're difficult wounds to clean, uh, and the blood isn't going to carry much uh, microbe out of the wound. So if whatever it is that caused the puncture wound was dirty, um, or if it picked up some microbes from your skin on its way through, which is quite likely, then uh, it's very possible that it deposits some bacteria deep into the tissue because puncture wounds are usually pretty deep. Uh, and uh, deep in the tissue, uh, if the, the wound seals over it, it can start growing 
uh, creating a wound abscess. And wound abscesses can be really nasty. They can actually, uh, because like the, the microbes start like growing in here, and even if the, the wound is scabbed over, the abscess will start swelling with pus and eventually just burst free. And they can actually tear a much bigger wound uh, uh, bursting out of there than they had initially. So um, with puncture wounds, you really need to worry about primary wound contamination, abscesses, and uh, the fact that, um, that, that because they scab over quickly, uh, the, that the wounds are hard to clean and, and uh, more likely to um, deposit bacteria deep down, All right? Third, you can have a laceration, All right? A laceration is where tissue is torn. We would usually call this a scrape or something like that. So like imagine you're riding a bike downhill, pretty fast clip and some idiot has left out their garbage can in the middle of the road and you boom, run into it and <laughs> like scrape all the way down the road on your forearms for like 20 feet. Uh, not that I'm uh, drawing any of that from experience. Okay, so lacerations uh, are usually very shallow. So they're not gonna deposit uh, microbes into deep tissue where they're likely to, to form abscesses or they're likely to, to, to lead to deep tissue infections. Okay, so that's good. Secondly, they tend to bleed very profusely because they, they cover a lot of area. Um, that will also tend to carry any microbes away from the injury. Um, on the negative side, they tend to cover a lot of area, which means that they're really hard to keep clean. Uh, I mean, just because there's so much of it there that uh, it's there's, there's more wound to watch out for getting infection, and just the more of your surface area that's covered in wound, the more likely it is that some part of it's going to get contaminated. And another bad thing is, you know, it kind of depends on how you get your scrape, but most uh, lacerations are going to come from, like, some fall or something like that, uh, where your skin is abraded against the ground, which means that the wounds are typically pretty dirty, right? You get, like, cut by a knife or stabbed by a nail or something like that, the chances are pretty good that whatever object wounded you uh, doesn't have a whole bunch of microbes on it, but you take a, a spill on the asphalt or on the uh, dirt and all of that ground contaminated soil gets basically just drowned into your wounds. So there's high likelihood, if not certainty, of wound contamination in the primary. So with lacerations, it becomes particularly important to clean them out after getting them uh, and to bandage them and monitor the bandaging. They're surface wounds, so infections of them are often less dangerous, but more likely in many cases. Uh, contusion is a crush injury, usually one in which the skin is not broken. If the skin is not broken, then you usually don't have to worry about infection, at least most of the time. If a contusion is bad enough, you might get tissue necrosis, and that can have its own set of issues. But uh, for the most part, with uh, crush injuries, we don't worry about infection. We worry about other things. Last type of wound is a burn, All right? So with a burn, uh, so the good thing is that you don't have to worry about primary contamination, right? 
because you were on fire, which means that any microbes that were on your skin are now dead. Um, so the wound starts off sterile. The problem is keeping it sterile. Burn wounds often occupy a large portion of the skin and um, they, because they cauterize, uh, the, the capillaries and blood vessels are burned shut, which means that burn wounds tend to be wet wounds. They don't scab over. And one of the functions of a scab is to keep microbes out of the wound. It forms like a seal over the wound so that it's more difficult for microbes to get in and cause secondary infections. Burn wounds don't scab that well um, because of the nature of the injury that they cause, which means that they are at extreme risk for secondary infection. So with burns, the main thing that you've got to worry about, at least from a microbiology perspective, is keeping the wound clean and well cared for. Uh, there are actually microbes, some of which we'll talk about, that specialize in infecting burn wounds. Um, so like your normal skin bacteria actually doesn't particularly like to infect burn wounds um, because they... Uh, they tend to prefer a dry environment. Um, but there are bacteria that usually prefer a wet environment, and those bacteria uh, will, will sometimes prefer or specialize to, uh, to infect burn wounds. Now, I mentioned wound abscesses earlier, and I wanted to kind of uh, reiterate that point. So what is an abscess? An abscess is when you have a pathogen contamination, typically a bacteria. By the way, wound infections are almost always bacterial infections. Uh, there are very few viruses that specialize or... Um, uh, yeah, or, or that, uh, that, that intentionally have as a part of their life cycle that they contaminate wounds. I mean, like HIV and other bloodborne viruses can infect you through wounds or through needles or through anything like that, but it's not the main way that they're spread, at least not normally. Um, so most of the things that in fact, wounds are going to be stuff that either lives on your skin or that lives in the environment, and that usually means bacteria or fungi. And fungi, um, there are a few fungi that can cause wound infections, but fungi actually prefer to live in drier environments uh, than your blood most of the time. And, and so they, well, there are some fungi that cause wound infections, it's, it's usually only going to be in um, the elderly or the immunocompromised. So mostly when we're talking about wounds, we're talking about bacteria. And so we got a pathogen here and it has been deposited deep into the tissue. Um, the deeper, the better. And then the pathogen, the bacteria, uh, begins to multiply and colonize the area and pretty quickly is going to get detected by macrophages or dendritic cells and usually uh, an inflammatory response will be initiated. So in order for an abscess to happen, you have to have whatever caused the wound uh, seals over, right? So maybe you got like a, a tiny puncture that very quickly scabbed over and healed quickly. Um, in uh, non-humans, like particularly cats, uh, uh, cats originally evolved in a desert environment, and uh, so their their wounds clot very, very quickly uh, to prevent water loss. So they are particularly prone to abscesses um, because 
their their uh, their wounds will often heal over faster than um, than they can clean out the wound. Uh, but once you have like inflammation, you have white blood cells that come into the area, as you see here, and you have inflammation of the area, and it fills up with pus, and the pressure of that pus eventually builds up to the point where it will burst free from the tissue. Um, abscesses often occur in the deeper tissue around the skin, where when they burst free, they cause like a lot more damage coming out than they did going in. They can like tear open a huge wound coming out and it's often going to be a open like ulcerous wound that doesn't heal property properly and can get infected by multiple different bacteria. But abscesses can also occur in bone uh, and um, even on occasion in your brain. So often uh, treatment for abscesses, well, it, it's, it's often going to be antibiotics if you know what caused the abscess, uh, but sometimes uh, proper treatment is to actually open up the abscess to relieve the pressure, to allow the pus to escape so that it doesn't tear itself a new hole. Uh, and then once the pressure has been relieved, you can treat properly with, with antibiotics or with cleaning it out or whatever is necessary for that particular organism. So common bacterial wound infections. Well, the most common thing to infect a wound is going to be whatever it is that happens to be living on your skin. Uh, because most wound infections are going to be like whatever causes the wound, like picks up some bacteria on its way through the skin and deposits it in the wound. Or even secondary infection, what's the most likely thing to infect secondarily? Well, it's going to be whatever is living near the wound. Or if you're like poking the wound with your finger or something like that, it's going to be whatever lives on your finger. So this is mostly going to be other skin bacteria, uh, which are mostly staphylococci. So staph epidermidis and staph aureus, both of which are common skin bacteria. Uh, it's also entirely possible if a wound, um, like you, you're not supposed to do this, but a lot of people will like lick or suck a wound to get it to close. Well, you've got a bunch of bacteria in your mouth that are capable of causing infections, many of them strep, uh, that can cause wound infections. Or if the wound is a bite wound, which, I mean, doesn't sound like it would be all that common, but, you know, go back historically and, like, you got bit by a, a wild animal or something like that, you might get it contaminated with whatever... Um, mouth flora they have, or actually human bite wounds are more common than you would think, mostly because a lot of them don't come from like technically being bitten, but like let's say you get into a bar fight with someone and you like punch them in the mouth and you uh, you like scrape your knuckles open on their teeth, that's technically a bite wound and it can get contaminated with mouth flora. Uh, when wounds get infected, there are several consequences. First off, they don't heal very well. Secondly, the formation of abscesses, which we've already talked about. And third, a, even a local um, bacterial infection can expand. It can get into the bloodstream, it can spread throughout the tissues, and it can cause severe infection. So first big category is staphylococcal wound infections. Um, staphylococci, the leading cause of wound infections. Staph epidermidis is certainly the most common, um, but one of the least severe. Right? So there are more than 30 recognized strains of staphylococcus. 
Uh, the two that account for most human infections are Aureus and Epidermidus. Both of them are pyogenic, meaning that they produce pus, um, as well as significant inflammation. Um, Aureus is usually more pyogenic than Epidermidus, often significantly so due to its virulence factors. Uh, the infection can cause, uh, will usually cause significant inflammation. Um, so we all know what that is. Uh, if the infection spreads, it can cause fever. Uh, and depending upon the virulence factors of the organisms involved, it can lead to uh, toxic shock syndrome, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, or a number of other things. So the causative agent, staph bacteria. Staph bacteria are always going to be gram-positive cocci that uh, grow in clusters. Um, staph are typically uh, facultative anaerobes, so they can grow aerobically or anaerobically. They're salt tolerant, so they can survive in foods and on the skin. Uh, and they can transfer easily from person to person or through fomites. Of the two, uh, Staph aureus is definitely the one that you want to worry more about. Um, there are a bunch of different uh, virulence factors that Staph aureus can have. Note that like no Staph aureus is going to have all of the virulence factors at the same time, but uh, any particular one might have several of them. So most strains of Staph aureus have coagulase, um, which allows it to aid the immune system. Most of them have clumping factor, which aids in wound colonization. Some of them are going to have protein A, which hides the cells from phagocytes. Some of them are going to have alpha toxin, which is a toxin that punches holes in cell membranes and is usually used to attack back against the, uh, um, actually alpha toxin is primarily going to be used to lyse your red blood cells, although I believe it can also lyse other cells. So uh, most strains of Staph aureus are beta hemolytic. Uh, Staph epidermidis does not have very many virulence factors. Um, so it does not have much evasive activity. If it gets into a wound, it usually just causes a little bit of a staph infection and your immune system clears it up relatively quickly. Because staph aureus is the most common bacteria on your skin, basically every time you get a cut or a scrape or a whatever, you are almost certain to get a staph infection. Your body and your immune system have been dealing with them since the day you were born. So uh, they don't have much invasive activity. They mostly stay in the localized area so they, they don't usually move into the blood unless there's a wound that goes deep enough that it deposits them into the blood. This is particularly a problem with uh, injected drug users, intravenous drug users, uh, because then the needle is going into the vein, and if you deposit Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis, either one of them, into your blood, then... Um, then yeah, that's going to be bad no matter what. Uh, so there are uh, strains that allow for colonization uh, of indwelling devices. Uh, Epidermidis can grow as a biofilm, uh, so it can cause problems, again, with, say, intravenous catheters uh, or other... Uh, devices that, uh, that, that go into your body. They can actually start growing. The staff can, can colonize, say, the catheter tube that's external, and they can follow that into your body and into your blood. And if they get into your blood, they can cause a severe infection. Uh, pathogenesis. 
So, with Staff Aureus, um, systemic spread. So, Staph Aureus can actually move throughout the tissues. It starts off as a local infection, but many strains of Staph Aureus have collagenase and hyaluronidase that will allow them to move throughout the connective tissue and infect other organs spreading to other parts of the body. They can get into the blood where they can infect the heart and joints um, where they can cause abscesses there and you don't want to get an abscess in your heart. An abscess in your heart probably kills you. An abscess in your joint very, very unhappy. Many strains of Staph aureus produce a variety of toxins. Uh, some of them produce what's called staphylococcal toxic shock toxin, uh, which causes toxic shock, as you might guess. Uh, it acts as a super antigen, leading to toxic shock syndrome. There's also alpha toxin, uh, hemolysin, um, various other toxins that they can make. Epidermidis is typically cleared up by, an, by a healthy immune system. Uh, if it gets into the blood, then it can migrate to your heart, uh, where it can grow as a biofilm, causing a condition called uh, uh, bacterial endocarditis, which is something that we'll talk about in a future lecture. Usually epidermidis, usually epidermidis, uh, assuming it doesn't get into the blood, is um, really only a problem in people who are pretty severely immunocompromised because, like I said, your immune system has been dealing with them since forever and, uh, and just, most people's gotten pretty good at it. Epidemiology. It doesn't really need to spread from person to person because it's already on you. We all have populations of staph bacteria on our skin. Every one of us is going to have epidermidis. And, um, you know, the, uh, uh, and staph aureus is present on some people all the time and on all of the people some of the time. Uh, if you are a nasal carrier of staph epidermidis, which if you work in a hospital environment, you almost certainly are, you are at a greater risk of surgical wound infection. Uh, 30 to 100%, somewhere in that range, of staph infections are caused by a patient's own flora. Uh, risk factors include age, immunosuppression, and prolonged hospital stay. Prevention, um, pretty Impossible, actually, because it's your own flora that's infecting you. Uh, you can prevent staph infections by engaging in good uh, wound cleaning techniques, by making sure that you use an antibiotic ointment on any wounds, and by making certain that you uh, uh, give pre-surgical anti-staph medication. Mm -hmm. Um, which is prophylactic and probably does contribute to the uh, continued emergence of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, but it cuts post-surgical wound infections by half. Treatment uh, is primarily antibiotic in nature. Uh, staph acquire antibiotic-resistant very easily. Any bacteria can acquire antibiotic resistance, but due to some fluke of genetics, staph happens to be particularly good at it. And so strains of antibiotic resistant staph, like MRSA and VERSA, evolve very rapidly. At this point, most staph is resistant to penicillin. All right, penicillin's just not very useful in treating most staph infections. Um, methicillin is a, uh, a antibiotic that was a penicillin derivative that was uh, designed specifically to be effective against bacteria that had become resistant to penicillin, but 
as you're no doubt aware, many uh, uh, there's a lot of MRSA out there, which is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Uh, so a lot of Staph has gotten resistant to MRSA. Vancomycin is a uh, second line of defense. It also works against the cell wall, but through a different mechanism. And there are strains of uh, antibiotic vancomycin resistant uh, Staph aureus or Versa. So it becomes important to know the antibiotic resistance profile of the bacteria that you're treating. Group A streptococcal infections. So group A strep um, are S. pyogenes and its relatives. They're typically going to be beta hemolytic. And of them, strep pyogenes is the main one. Uh, they're sometimes known as flesh eaters. Uh, the the flesh-eating bacteria or necrotizing fasciitis uh, is, can, is more frequently caused by strep pyogenes than anything else, although Staph aureus can also, uh, can also cause necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, group A strep, strep infections can be rapidly fatal. Um, they are fortunately easily treated once diagnosed. Uh, most uh, strep pyogenes does not have antibiotic resistance, and there are lots of antibiotics, including just like base level penicillin, that works pretty well against them. So if you catch them early, they're very easy to treat. Um, more severe infections of uh, strep pyogenes and other group A streps include pneumonia, meningitis, purpural or childbirth fever, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, where the bacteria propagates underneath, you can see some necrotizing fasciitis up here, uh, the bacteria propagates underneath the skin releasing a toxin that causes the, basically that causes your skin to peel off. And uh, having your skin peel off is bad and uh, often leads to death. And necrotizing fasciitis can often be very difficult to treat if you don't get to it early enough. Um, and there's also streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, which some uh, strains of strep pyogenes make streptococcal toxic shock toxin, which is also a super antigen, works very similar to staphylococcal toxic shock toxin. Uh, group A strep are very highly pyogenic. Um, as you might guess from the name, pyogenes, right? They cause lots of inflammation, lots of redness, lots of swelling, lots of pus, lots of pain, because that is one of the cardinal signs of inflammation. So the symptoms are going to be acute pain at the site of the wound, swelling, often dramatic swelling, fever and confusion, uh, pyogenic organisms cause a lot of fever, and particularly strep pyogenes causes a lot of fever. Uh, skin tightening due to the swelling and discoloration due to often uh, uh, toxins produced by the bacteria that basically cause um, blood to either lice or um, to coagulate, resulting in blotchy, dark skin. In the absence of treatment, group A streptococcal infections have a high likelihood of death, uh, usually due to shock after they manage to get their way into the blood. Uh, with treatment, prognosis is much better. The earlier the treatment occurs, the better your chances. Causative agent, typically strep pyogenes, Beta hemolytic gram-positive cocci growing in chains. 
Uh, the virulence, there are actually a bunch of different virulence factors that strep pyogenes can have, but uh, two of the important ones are exotoxin A, which is the super antigen causing streptococcal toxic shock, and exotoxin B, which uh, is the, which causes necrosis of tissue. Uh, it breaks down proteins in tissue and, well, proteins are kind of what your tissue's made out of, so then your tissue kind of liquefies and falls apart. Pathogenesis. Um, so the, the bacteria, um, actually strep pyogenes tends towards being either microaerophilic or, um, or anaerobic, so uh, often they don't grow very well on the surface of your skin. They also don't like salt very much. Um, so usually the bacteria has to be deposited kind of medium deep in order to, uh, to cause an infection, at least to have a good chance of causing a, a, an infection. Um, once wound colonization has occurred, uh, your subcutaneous fascia can be destroyed through necrotizing fasciitis. That's the exotoxin B that's going to destroy the tissue. Um, muscle tissue can also be destroyed if the bacteria penetrate deep enough. Uh, the bacteria grows and continues to produce toxin. Uh, and when the toxins enter the bloodstream, particularly the uh, uh, exotoxin A, then you go into toxic shock and die. Epidemiology, so so-called flesh-eating bacteria has been known for a long time. It's one of the things, one of the things that we have recorded in the earliest medical records that we have around 5th century BC because, you know, if somebody's skin falls off and they look like they're being eaten by something invisible, that's the sort of thing people tend to write down. Um, cases are generally sporadic, and it's thought that most cases probably come from a person's natural flora. Uh, like they have a native population of strep pyogenes, which is a fairly common bacteria to have. Just don't get it in your wounds. Um, it also, like, it, it doesn't usually happen with superficial wounds. You have to get it contaminated into a relatively deep wound, uh, in order for necrotizing fasciitis to occur. There was an outbreak in San Francisco in 1996 traced to contaminated black tar heroin. And of course, anytime you're injecting something contaminated with bacteria into your arteries, well, it's not gonna go very well for you. Prevention and treatment. Um, other than proper wound care, there isn't much prevention that works. Uh, you can give anti-streptococcal drugs before surgery, and that will reduce incidence of uh, nosocomial infections. Um, you know, you can try to not contaminate your wound. Uh, you can put antibiotic ointment on your wound. You try not to get wounded. Those are the general prevention methods. Uh, as far as treatment goes, first line treatment is usually going to be antibiotics. And if you catch it in an early stage of the infection, that will usually work just fine because it's not very antibiotic resistant. Depending upon how the bacteria goes and exactly which uh, virulence factors it has, antibiotics may be more or less effective. Generally speaking for necrotizing fasciitis, once it starts necrotizing the tissue, well, blood is no longer being effectively delivered to the back to, to the tissue, um, which means that if you take antibiotics, then the the antibiotics aren't going to be carried to the bacteria because blood flow is stopped going to the dead tissue. Uh, if necrotizing fasciitis begins to spread, uh, then amputation may be necessary, if it's even a possibility. Um, penicillin is usually effective against most strains of streptococcus, 
uh, assuming that you have a, an appropriate delivery mechanism, but um, it won't affect bacteria that are in necrotic tissue because no blood flows to it, and it won't stop the toxin. So if you have an advanced enough infection, you could kill the bacteria, but there may still be enough toxin in your body that it will destroy enough tissue to kill you uh, if it spreads. So even if you kill off the bacteria, it can sometimes still be necessary uh, to amputate the tissue before the toxin gets into the blood. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a uh, gram-negative rod uh, that's an opportunistic pathogen. And it is most known for causing nosocomial infections. Uh, it sometimes also is a community-acquired disease, but it's most known for being nosocomial, which means acquired in a hospital setting. The two main things that it likes to do, it likes to infect wet tissue. Right, so not most wounds, but it uh, is known to infect the lungs in people who have a weakened lung condition, particularly in cystic fibrosis patients. And it is well known for infecting burn wounds. Uh, it is like... If you don't have a burn wound um, or a lung condition, then for most otherwise healthy people, they don't get infected. It can infect uh, immunocompromised people, usually fairly severely immunocompromised people. Uh, Pseudomonas Aruginosa has a characteristic or makes a characteristic green pigment. So you can see uh, on this picture, uh, this unfortunate man here had a extensive burn wound on his back. And you can see that it's been colonized by uh, this bacteria that's causing it to become green. That's because of the pseudomonas. Um, so this green pigment is a diagnostic symptom of pseudomonal uh, infection. As far as the symptoms go, uh, other than the, the tissue color change, it's a gram-negative bacteria. And mostly it is going to kill through endotoxin release. So uh, endotoxins produce, they're highly pyogenic. Uh, produce chills, fever, skin lesions that don't heal, um, and eventually gram-negative septi uh, septicemia, followed by death. Uh, the causative agent, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is a uh, gram-negative rod, uh, flagellated, and usually a strict aerobe. Uh, does not grow well in anaerobic environments, which is why it doesn't colonize deep wounds, right? So burn wounds are all on the surface where it's going to still have access to the oxygen in the air. Uh, pathogenesis. Um, generally speaking, it colonizes a wound, causes tissue damage, prevents healing. Um, usually it's going to uh, what, what'll kill you with it is uh, if it gets into your blood, it'll cause septic shock. There are some strains that also produce uh, other virulence factors, which you can see here. You don't need to know their mechanism, just know that it has some virulence factors. Uh, Pseudomonas is a common environmental bacteria. It does not usually live on the skin, but it lives in the soil. And it really, it, it's really tough um, and hard to kill. So Pseudomonas is well known for being able to resist many commercial cleaning products uh, and being resistant to many uh, like mid, mild to mid-level disinfectants.
So in uh, particularly in a hospital setting, people are always walking in, they're always walking out, and they track dirt in that dirt contains pseudomonas. And uh, like hospitals are, of course, constantly being cleaned, but since pseudomonas uh, is resistant to most industrial cleaners, it, like, once a population of pseudomonas gets into a hospital setting, it can stay there for an extended period of time. It particularly likes damp environments. Uh, it's also one of the only bacteria that can actually grow in soap. So it will contaminate soaps, ointments, eye drops, hospital equipment, and cause infections from these points. Uh, prevention and treatment. So prevention is get rid of the bacteria, which, as I said, can be quite a task because it's difficult to get rid of. Uh, prompt wound care, keeping the wound clean, uh, making sure that everyone is properly washing their hands and using hand sanitizer before you change somebody's uh, uh, dressings, particularly making sure that the patient themselves does not po poke at the dressing. Um, antibiotic cream containing silver uh, sulfadiazine. So that actually contains two sort of antibiotics in it. The sulfadiazine is an antibiotic of the sulfa drug category. Um, and the silver is an antiseptic. So the two of these things together uh, combine to make a pretty effective wound cream. Uh, much pseudomonas is multi-drug resistant, meaning that once an infection becomes established, it can be very t difficult to treat usually requiring high doses and extended treatment periods uh, of antibiotics and other medications. All right, cat scratch disease, sometimes called cat scratch fever for the famous song, or the famous song being named for it. Don't know which is true. Uh, so cat scratch disease is, uh, I like it, even though it's not very common. Uh, standard symptoms are, first off, it usually starts with a scratch, typically from a cat, uh, and uh, a few weeks, or uh, within a week, so days to a week, uh, after the scratch, you get pustules forming where the scratch is. And then the local lymph nodes, which will usually be the axillary lymph nodes because most people get cat scratches on their arms or hands. Um, so the closest lymph nodes are gonna be the axillary lymph nodes will begin to swell. Uh, they enlarge in one to seven weeks uh, and in about half of patients become filled with pus. Uh, in about a third of patients, high fever will develop. The causative organism is Bartonella hensilae, which is a slightly curved gram-negative bacillus. It's kind of like Vibrio-esque. Uh, it is, uh, so other symptoms, so uh, actually this should be pathogenesis. In most people, the disease is self-limiting and disappears in two to four months. Um, humans are typically a dead-end host. Uh, it can infect the eyes, causing eye irritation with local lymph node enlargement. Those are likely to be your um, cervical lymph nodes. Cervical? Yeah. Um... If it gets into the brain, it can cause encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain tissue, causing seizures, coma, and eventual death, though that is very rare. Uh, it can infect the bloodstream and infect heart valves. All of these symptoms are usually found in people who are immunocompromised, elderly, or young. So, uh, 
Uh, Bartonella hensilae is not particularly infectious to otherwise healthy adults, um, but has been known to cause serious illness in children, uh, the old and particularly the severely immunocompromised. Here you can see right there is the site of the scratch with the pustules forming along it. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see in this region here and down into the armpit region, the axillary uh, lymph nodes are swollen. Uh, so epidemiology, um, most people who are infected are under 18. Uh, it's zoonotic, particularly from cats, as you might guess from the name, and mainly by kittens. Uh, I don't know exactly why mainly by kittens. I believe that it's because adult cats are much better at cleaning their uh, claws. Cats are infected by the bite of a flea, and the standard illness moves between fleas and cats. Humans are a dead-end host. It doesn't want to get into you, but if it does get into you, it can theoretically cause a disease. Um, prevention and treatment. Prevention, don't get scratched by a cat. If you do get scratched by a cat, clean the wound out well. Uh, particularly avoid handling stray cats, except they're so, so cute. But try not to get scratched by them. Um, if you have signs of an infection, get it evaluated. Usually ampicillin is uh, the treatment of choice. Some strains are resistant to ampicillin and you have to go to a different antibiotic. All right, so that's what I